Hey everyone, this is the AWS specific part two for CloudBlock step-by-step -step guide. Let's get started. I'll begin from the GitHub page and scroll up to the AWS directory and then scroll down to the step-by-step -step instructions all the way to the AWS specific. First thing we need to do, open PowerShell and start Windows Subsystem Linux. Then we'll CD into our home directory and install Python 3 pip, a package manager for Python that'll allow us to install the AWS CLI. We're prompted for our password. That's the same password we created when we set up Windows Subsystem Linux. This will take just a second. I'll be back. Python 3 pip has been installed. We can now use that to install the AWS CLI. I'll be back when it's done. The AWS CLI has finished installing. Now we'll create a non-root AWS user in the Amazon Web Console with admin permissions. This is the user that Terraform will run as to build out all of our cloud resources. I'll log into my AWS account. First, I'll find I am. We can do that from here. Type in I am. Next, we need to add a user. You can give it a name. I'll call it Terraform. We'll need to check both boxes, programmatic access, that's like the CLI, and then management console access. This will allow us to get our WireGuard configurations through a browser when we're done. Now that we've checked both boxes, it'll ask us for a password. Go ahead and create a password, something nice and secure. And I usually uncheck this. Next time we log in with this user, it's going to ask us to change the password. I'll uncheck that so it doesn't prompt us. I'll hit next. Let me open this up a bit. We need to attach an existing policy directly. This is an account that needs a lot of permissions to build out all the resources. I'll check the administrator access box and hit next. You can tag if you want. If there's tags that you want to use, I don't need to. Let's review the username Terraform, programmatic access, and AWS Management Console access. It has the administrator policy. Let's hit create user. All right, we'll need to copy the access key and secret key into the CLI. Let's follow along in the step-by-step -step instructions. We'll run this set admin user credentials command. It's asking us for the access key. That's the first value. And then the secret access key. Generally, this is a confidential, it's almost like a password. Keep this secret and safe, don't share it. I'll show mine because I'm gonna destroy this project when I'm done. Paste it in. A default region name. You don't necessarily need to set it, but it's a good idea to do a little research on where you'll be deploying this project. I'll use US East 1. And then a default output format. You can leave it blank. We can validate the configuration if we run this command. This will show us our account number, which we might need later, our user ID, and then the user that we're calling from the CLI. We can now begin customizing our deployment. First, we'll CD into the AWS specific subdirectory, and we'll do the same thing in File Explorer. Navigate with this address. So I'll open File Explorer and paste it in. Now one thing to note, I have the name Chad up here at the top, it might be a little hard to see. Replace that with your Windows Subsystem Linux username. If you don't know your username, type in who am I? And there's mine, Chad. You'll find the file aws.tfrs, that's where we'll store our variables and the ones that we customize. Double click it, it may prompt you for an application. I just use Notepad. The first thing we can set is the PyHall password. I'll set it to change me one. Next, we want the instance key. This is our SSH key, and here's the command to grab the public portion of it. There it is. You don't need this little bit at the end. 
I usually highlight from here back to copy from PowerShell, right click. Paste it in between the quotes. Next, we need our management cider. This is the IP range that's granted access to the PyHole web UI, uh, able to SSH into the instance, and also permitted to run DNS lookups if another variable called DNS underscore no VPN is equal to one, which is the default. If you're deploying from home, this should be your public IP address with a slash 32 suffix. If you don't know your public IP address, very simple and straightforward to figure out. Go to Google, type in what is my IP, and you'll get your response. I'll copy that in. Remember, leave the slash 32 there. We also need to set the KMS manager. Let me go back to the instructions. This is the username we just created uh, in the web console. Mine was Terraform. That is everything you must be setting. There are a few more that you may want to look at before we run the deployment. Next on the list is the WireGuard peers. This is the number of peer configurations for the WireGuard VPN. The default is 20. There's really no harm in creating more than you need, and you'll need at least one per device. So if you've got a couple cell phones, uh, maybe a tablet, a couple laptops, make sure you've got a number here large enough to support all of your devices. Um, there's really no upper limit that I'm aware of. I think it might be around 250. Next, the DNS over HTTPS provider. I've set mine to open DNS by default. It works for me, fairly reliable. Maybe do some research on DNS over HTTPS providers and the different things that they offer or uh, their location and their performance. We can also tell WireGuard to either generate configurations so that we only run DNS through the VPN or we run all traffic through the VPN. It is set to DNS by default. And if we look at the deployment image, you'll see that only DNS traffic runs through the configuration or our deployment. And then all of our normal traffic, like browsing the internet, is done through our provider, our internet provider. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you want to have a traditional VPN where all of your traffic is routed to this cloud that you're setting up, you could change this from DNS to all. But keep in mind the cost implications. Um, there is a significant cost associated with outbound traffic from the cloud. DNS is very fairly lightweight and won't cost much, but if you were to set this to all and then try to watch Netflix or some other streaming service, you might be incurring charges. Uh, lastly, the AWS region. Actually, we've got two more things. The AWS region, pick a region that um, works for best for you as far as location. So I'm in Florida, US East one is fine. There's really not a huge difference between all of the US regions for me. Um, the one thing I'll note though, is it must have an ARM, it must support ARM type virtual machines. And I'll show how to find that here. So you can set your region. Uh, in this first command and then run the whole thing and it will tell you if your region supports arm instances let's try this command out i'll check to see if us east one supports arm and you can see i got a response there that shows the different types of arm instances in the region if we were to look at something like us west one which generally doesn't get a lot of new products because it's a uh, costly to build out you'll see there's no response so us west one would not be a valid aws region to deploy this project in because it has no arm type instances what else do we have you can see the instance type is set that's an arm based instance t4g.micro is perfect for this project it's very lightweight it doesn't cost a lot in fact it's free until i think the end of 2020 as a test we also need the Ubuntu image in that region. It gets updated occasionally, and we can run a similar command to figure out what version of the image we need. I'll paste the command in. You'll see I'm still using AWS region equal US East one. 
and there's the image version. Occasionally they get updated, uh, Ubuntu releases a new version, and you'll want to fill that in before you deploy. So let me grab it and paste it in. Yeah, you can see here this one was based in September, and we've now got an October version. Done. The account number, uh, that's the official Ubuntu account number, it probably does not need to be changed. You can look at the very uncommon variables. Um, generally, these don't need to be edited, and I'll leave them the same in my project. All right, we're done with the variables section. I'll save, close it out. And if I scroll down back to the instructions, we've edited the file and saved it. Make sure you're in the proper directory within Windows Subsystem Linux. We are. And then we'll initialize Terraform. This will tell Terraform to download AWS specific code and any other thing it needs. Should be pretty quick. While that's happening, I'll grab the next command. This is Terraform apply. And this is kind of the magic of Terraform. Terraform will read through the project's configuration files and those customized variables and determine what needs to be built in AWS. We'll give this just a moment to complete. Okay, and Terraform tells us it has a plan to add 45 different resources. You can kind of scroll up and see the resources that it's going to create, but I'll hit yes. And we'll give this a little bit. This, is, and this process entirely depends on how long it takes AWS to create our resources. Um, it may take quite some time, give it five, 10, maybe even up to 15 minutes. It really depends on the region, how well AWS is doing that day, how resource constrained it is. I'll be back when it's done. Okay, Terraform has completed the deployment. All of our cloud resources are built. One thing I wanna note is this is Terraform plus Ansible configuring the services. Terraform is done, but if we scroll to the top in the diagram, you'll see in the hexagon Terraform plus Ansible. Ansible will be responsible con for configuring the cloud virtual machine. We can watch Ansible do its work. I scroll back down. By SSHing into the instance, that's the output from Terraform that helps us out. I'll, uh, just one thing to note, you can right click after highlighting to copy and then right click again to paste. The first time we access the instance, it'll ask us if we want to continue, I'll type in yes. And then we can run this command to check the Ansible progress. It's a long command, make sure you grab the whole thing. Paste it in. And we can see it's still going. There will be an output at the very end. I'll be back once it's done. You can run that command a few times and watch the progress as it goes. Also worth mentioning is a utility called HTOP, H-T-O-P. It's a, kind of a, sh a showcase of what the machine is doing. And you can see here, Python and pip are installing and there are things that are running in the background. Things are still going along. Um, you can get out of HTOP with control C. Okay, Ansible has completed everything. I've been running the command to watch the logs occasionally, and we see here a play recap with failed equals zero. We are good to go. I'm gonna log out of the machine. And if I run Terraform apply again, I can get those outputs one more time. We should be able to log into the PyHole web UI. Let's try it out. I'll grab this, right click to copy, and in a new tab, I'll paste it in. Our connection isn't private, that's okay. That's just because we've got a self-signed certificate. Our connection is still encrypted. Let me turn off my dark reader and log in. This will be the password that I set in my variables file. Mine was change me one. And there we have it. We're logged into the PyHole. We can configure it as needed. The one thing I'll mention about the PyHole configuration that's a little bit special, under settings and then DNS, if I scroll down here, you'll see custom IP addresses. This is our DNS over HTTPS container. If we were to look in the example, this is the container here in the right. 
Um, we use that to talk with our DOE provider, our DNS over HTTPS provider securely. So you may not want to change that setting, but everything else, feel free, go ahead. What else do we want to do? We can look at the WireGuard configurations in AWS. So I'll go back to the outputs and we see here WireGuard comps one per device will be available at this URL. I'll grab it, paste it in. Now I'll need to be logged in as the Terraform user and I'm not at the moment. Let me log out. There's that account number. We'll need that. I'm actually going to grab it now sign out and then let me turn dark reader off again i'll log back in this time i'll log in as the terraform i am user i'll put my account number in terraform was my username and my password let's grab the url one more time paste it in the address bar And if we scroll down, we can see each of the configuration for our peers. And there were 20 because that's the variable that we set uh, for our VPN. If I click one of these, you'll see the four configuration files. You may need any of any particular part of these uh, this list for your WireGuard VPN client. The one I'll use the most is the peer1.png. Let me check it and download. If I open this up, we can now see a QR code. If I have the WireGuard app installed on my phone, whether it's Android or iOS, an iPad, a tablet, you can open the WireGuard app, hit scan QR code, put your camera up to the screen, and it will automatically configure the VPN for you. Whenever that VPN is turned on, you are connected to the Pi Hole for DNS-based ad blocking. That's whether you're at home or out and about in your on your on your mobile service provider. Maybe you're on 4G LTE, uh, public Wi-Fi as well. All of your DNS lookups will call back to your cloud platform that you set up. Uh, that's about it. The last thing I'll note is if you're at home, you can also change your router's DNS to the IP address we see in the output. So at home and only at home, you can change your configuration on your local network to point to this for ad block DNS based on the Pi Hole. Finally, I'm going to destroy the project. Whoops, I just closed out of Windows Subsystem Linux. Let me get back in and I'll CD to Cloud Block AWS. And instead of Terraform Apply, this time I'll run Terraform Destroy. Terraform will delete or destroy all of the resources it created. So if you're ever done with your project, or maybe you want to change cloud providers to something else, you can run this command to erase everything Terraform has created. There's the output. It'll ask us, do you really want to destroy? I'll type in yes, and Terraform will happily delete everything it's created for us. That's it, everyone. Any questions, please feel free to let me know. Discord link below. Have a great day.